the how did Mary Magdalene come to be seen as a whore or a prostitute or a redeemed prostitute in the West? And you'll notice they use the West. It's not a tradition in Eastern Orthodoxy or among the Eastern Catholics, and it can actually cause dissension and strife if they if they exchange views on it. Let's have a look at some of that, and this will be quite lengthy. First, for a laugh, I asked the wonders of Copilot to summarise the story of Mary Magdalene, just to see what it would do. But we won't be using it for more than a minute or two. But what it what it gave back out, out was Mary Magdalene is a significant figure in the New Testament of the Bible, known for a close association with Jesus Christ. Before meeting Jesus, Mary Magdalene was originally from the town of Magdala. True, that's where the name comes from. Prior to meeting Jesus, she was afflicted by seven demons, which caused her great suffering. Healing, she encountered Jesus, who healed her by casting out these demons. Following Jesus, after her healing, Mary Magdalene became one of Jesus' most devoted followers. She supported his ministry and was present during some of the most pivotal moments in his life. And then goes on to talk about her role in the crucifixion and resurrection. And then it talks about the mistaken notion of her being a prostitute. What it doesn't point out... Um, is where it arose. It just tells you that it did arise. To understand why it arose, you need to dig down quite a, a long way. And for that, I've got the Biblical Archaeological Society and I've got my usual cup of coffee because I've still got a sodding dry throat. And yes, I know coffee is dehydrating, but this coffee has an awful lot of milk in it. Let's have a look at this article by Jane Schaberg from 1992. Mention the name Mary Magdalene, and most people would free associate the word whore, albeit the repentant whore whose love for Jesus led him to forgive her. They may do within Western Christianity, but I would say since this article was written over 30 years ago, some of that's died away, and more educated people who have a reasonable knowledge of the scriptures will tend to realise it was a mistaken association in the that came to be accepted over time. In Jesus Christ Superstar, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Timothy Rice's 1970s musical, she's decepted, depicted as a prostitute platonically in love with Jesus. You've got some other examples of roles she played there, including in the infamous Last Temptation of Christ, which caused the author, Nikos Kassantikis, to, to have a major falling out with the Greek Orthodox Church. But what I'm more interested in how she gets there you've got a lot of history there about her as a benefactor of philanthropist, her role with Christ as um, travelling with her and we'll be coming back to some of that in a minute. But Here's where I wanted to go to. How did this woman who travelled with Jesus in Galilee and was a witness to the epochable events become known as a whore? Nothing in the text that name her indicate that she had such a past. No, there's nothing in the Bible that would indicate Mary Magdala was a whore or a repentant prostitute. You can't really get it from the text. The most that can be said is she travelled to Jesus in Galilee where she exercised demon, where he exercised demons for her and she has resources of her own with which to serve, which suggests she was probably had some wealth of her own. It's clear that the text itself does not stigmatise that Magdalene is a whore. The first step in giving her this sullied past lies in interpretation. In early Christian interpretation, women mentioned several passengers became identified with the Magdalene. Yes, they became conflated, and not just from the Bible, which we'll get to in a bit. Non-biblical Marys and saints became conflated. So you had what became known as a conflated Mary Magdalene, where she became a composite personality. The most important motif that links some of these stories to the Magdalene, on which much interpretation is hung, is a motif of anointing. The Magdalene, it will be recalled, came to Jesus' tomb on the first Easter with spices to anoint him. Jesus was also, of course, called the Anointed One. Mary Magdalene is, is called in Orthodox tradition the, one of the mirror bearers, those who anointed Christ after death, and is highly regarded for that. She's sometimes given the title equal to the apostles, which is reserved for major saints. Let me go on anyway. So as 
natural of the unnamed woman who announced Jesus' head in Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9, and Matthew 26, 6 to 13, is identified in early traditions as the Magdalene, especially because in these pre crucifixion passages, this anointing is especially specifically said to be for Jesus' burial. So people have got confused, and you will notice that woman was repentant and had a sinful life who anoints Christ's feet, also in Luke chapter 7 and 36 to 50. Jesus tells Simon her sins, which were many, for forgiven, for she loved much, but he is forgiven, little loves little. Here too, later tradition identify the woman as the Magdalene. This became sort of codified later on in Christian tradition. It seems to, and it goes back further than Pope Gregory, by the way. Although Pope Gregory uh, codified it and it became ever more popular, Origen and John Chrysostom, um, a man of much controversy himself, made commentary about Mary Magdalene was being a wholly unsuitable first witness. John Christophe is also, of course, controversial and has become ever more controversial as the centuries have rolled by because of his thunderous sermons about the Jews, which, um, well, uh, they're hyperbolic and not to be taken literally, but even if you allow for that, they're, they're certainly something else. I'm not going to read all of this, but it's a really well-written document that gives you a really good background as to why and how Mary became conflated over time due to textual confusion, all sorts of other issues. You also have Mary of Egypt, who is a major saint, although she's become less well-known in sort of um, in, in later years. She was reasonably well-known enough when I was a kid that she was differentiated and we knew who she was, but I don't think she's so well-known anymore outside of the Middle East around um, Catholics from particular backgrounds where she would fill a particular role for veneration. She became sort of um, conflated with Mary Magdalene as well because uh, Mary of Egypt was by uh, is considered to have been a proper... Re- Institute who redeemed herself. And to have led an extremely dissolute life. And she's got mixed into the whole mess of things. You can see her there with um, medieval literature where she was quite a popular saint. A statue of Mary of Egypt there. Now, as to the Magdalene laundries... They indeed were not founded by the Irish, and the f- even in Ireland, the first Magdalene laundry, which drifted over and was inspired by the British model, was founded by this woman, who is not all that well remembered in Ireland, Lady Arabella. Lady Arabella was a philanthropist who lived from 1707 to 1792. She actually found of them after coming into contact with dissolute mothers who had no hope of keeping their kids with them and women who were prostitutes and so on. She had a fair, a much wider view of what they would do and how they might operate, I think, reading about her. And I've read about her a fairly large number of times and her view of what their purpose was and what they became later, well, they diverged. The reason they became so identified with Catholicism is that eventually Catholicism slowly, well, took over the running of them, from the, and they slowly drifted away from the control of the Anglican Church, and they did become an awful institution in many ways, more concerned with punishment than than anything else, and more concerned with sort of a, a lace curtain mentality that persisted in Ireland, and it must be said in Britain. Let's not presume, say the, this was a wholly an Irish sort of point of view of the world. It persisted for many, many years and produced poor results, in my opinion. 
Were they absolutely as horrific as sometimes they're portrayed as? No, I'd say probably not, but I certainly wouldn't want to be stuck in one. Um, they're difficult to talk about because any attempt to talk about them produces a, a an awkward argument sooner or later, and they tend to be a very heated topic of conversation. Robert Dingley here was the bloke who set them up in in England. He's an interesting enough figure in himself and was rather dissolute himself as a young man, it must be said to be quite humorously. He belonged to this thing, the Society of Dilettante, which is a club of people who had all done the grand, um, grand tour and all gone round Europe and all. And the grand tour can be regarded, for those who are not familiar with it, as essentially young men wandering around Europe, supposedly for cultural arrangement. Largely for many of them, it was essentially um, a giant piss-up going around Europe. As you can see here, history is a highly complicated and messy business. Mary Magdalene herself, let's get an art. There's a particular painting I'd like to get on the art an article where it shows from the article here on Wikipedia, where it shows the numerous artistic depictions of her and how they've varied throughout time and across different churches. This is by Tintoretto um, from 1598. Obviously, that's a penitent. You can see the sexual overtones in that particular art artwork. I'm going to have to be careful what I open because... I, I really do think YouTube is inhabited by the spirits of, of Puritanism, and it, it and it does a flip out if it sees a, a the hint of a trace of a woman's nipple or whatever. Yep, Apostle to the Apostles is another title. Um, by the way, used for Mary Magdalene, indicating her really really important role for. Oh, this is a photograph of. The ruins of Magdala, Mary Magdalene's hometown. It's listed as being circa 1900. We might have a quick look at Magdala actually at the end as a town. The conversion of Mary Magdalene by Paula Veronese. It's worth noticing, by the way, with all these sort of paintings, the symbolism in them. It's something I may do. Um, a video on because there's also always all sorts of hidden symbolism in the colors and the and the way they're set out let's see which other ones we've got flemish artists we, we um detail of mary magdalene weeping at the crucifixion of christ the deposition of christ And this is by the artist Alexander Andreevich Ivanov, where Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, famously sees Christ in the in the the after his resurrection. He tells her not to touch her, him, presumably because he is now sort of a, a not no longer part of the human race in, in to, an ex to a certain degree, having completed his earthly mission. Let's see which other renditions we've got. Accession, Ascension of Mary Magdalene. Oh, there's a whole tradition of thick body hair over this that I'd, I'd have to get into as well. This pops up in Mary of Egypt's rendition as well. Um, I, I'll try and do a small video about that, I think, because it's it's a kind of one of those oddities of medieval theology and thinking. Um, a gothic style of Mary Magdalene. I strangely like that. And this is pur purportedly Mary Magdalene's skull, which is held as a relic. 
And let's see what else we've got. And we've got quite a few more. Some of them, as I say, if I open them, I can just see YouTube doing a flip out because the odd sign of nudity is, is, a, is apparent in a few of them when they're enlarged. And YouTube goes into absolute craziness when you do that. But before I end, I have and um, just quickly look at my, um, sort of the town of Magdala itself. This is an icon of depicting her as a, a merbera. It's, it's a kind of fairly westernized icon, I must say. But it is an icon. And then there's the tradition of the three Marys which are the women mentioned in the canonical gospels, narratives of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Again, you get the problems of textual conflation with these. So gospels refer to several women named Mary after all, as this article points out. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Jacob, Mary of Clopas, Mary of Bethany. So it does get kind of mixed up and all over the place sometimes. Let's just look briefly at the town of Magdala and see how it looks today. As I Magdala was an ancient Jewish city on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, north of Tiberias, in the Babylonian Talmud, it is known as Magdala Nonia, meaning Tower of the Fishers. It's ruined, I believe, today, yes. There's an excavated synagogue from it. And it gives you a long history of it and across a large number of years. Some of that's quite of interest in itself, but since this, this video is already stretching out to quite a length um, and covered quite a bit of history, I'll stop it there.